Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fundraiser webinar on behalf of the New York Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, Stories of Heroism from the Frontline Fighters of the COVID Crisis. We are so happy you have joined us this evening. The call will start in one minute to allow a few more attendees to log on. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon and we will begin in one minute. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the New York Society of Interventional Pain Physicians for a fundraiser webinar. This one will focus on stories of heroism from the frontline fighters of the COVID crisis. We are so happy that you've joined us this evening and really appreciate your time. I would like to introduce our, I have a few webinar tips for everybody tonight. We sincerely want this webinar to be act, interactive and we look forward to your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please do so in the chat box. We will forward those questions on to our moderators. Please keep your questions succinct, and if you would like to specifically have one of the moderators or speakers address your question, please make sure that is clear at the beginning. We will attempt to answer all questions as time allows. I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sadir Dewan. Dr. Dewan is the president of Advanced Spine on Park Avenue. Dr. Dewan is a nationally and internationally um, recognized as a key opinion leader in the field of interventional pain management. He is the immediate past president of ASIP and the founder and chairman of NICIP and the New York, New Jersey Pain Symposium. Dr. Dewan, take it away. Thank you, Michelle, for kind of introduction. I'm so happy today because this is a webinar for a very special reason. We are here to uh, salute uh, those uh, frontline heroes who have put their life before, uh, they put their services before their life. And we have no words to to um, to appreciate that. Uh, I would like to start with it, uh, thanking my executive board who has worked tirelessly to make this fundraising webinar very successful. And especially who are not here on camera with us is uh, Ken Chapman and Ed Rubin. Ken is our president-elect and uh, Ed Rubin is past president. They have worked tirelessly to, again, raise the fund. And also I would like to appreciate services of Karina, who is front frontline worker from Montefiore Hospital, who is the secretary of NICE. With that, I'll um, start introducing our moderators today. And we are so fortunate to have uh, all these gentlemen here, Tim Deer, who is world-renowned pain physician, I'm sure you all know. He's a founding chairman of the American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. Um, second uh, moderator is Dr. Brian Durkin. Uh, Brian, um, uh, Nick, if you can turn off your camera, the Brian can come on for a second. Brian uh, is our pre current president of NICIP, and he is running the uh, uh, multi, uh, multiple centers, pain centers in, in Long Island. And our uh, another uh, the moderator is Dr. Chris Garibo. Dr. Garibo is also a world-renowned pain physician. He's a professor in NYU, and he is a past president of NICEP and a very very active. He's a course director of New York New Jersey Pain Symposium. Um, the next slide. Um, these are some the information. This slide you may see a few times. Uh, those who want to donate by check. Here is the make check payable to Ironman Foundation, and here is the address. And you can also donate on uh, online. If you have any question, you can reach out to Sandra. I want to uh, introduce uh, Sarah um, Hartman. Sarah is originally New Yorker. She is the executive director of Ironman Foundation. She uh, looks over all the activities of the charity work. She does fundraising drives and works with the board of directors very, very closely. Sarah. Good evening, everyone. 
and thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on the webinar this afternoon and for your support of Iron Aid. By way of background, the Ironman Foundation is the nonprofit arm of the Ironman Group and our family of around 250 endurance events worldwide. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and it's our mission to create positive impact through grant funding and supporting volunteer efforts. Uh, Dr. Deere has been a longtime supporter of the Ironman Foundation, He's raced multiple times with us at the Ironman World Championship in Hawaii. And just last year, he proposed that we launch a new program, which is now called Iron Aid, so that athletes in the medical profession could uh, raise funds and awareness for health related causes. And so this year, in the wake of the pandemic, the entire focus of the program, and frankly, the Ironman Foundation, is Iron Aid COVID-19 support fund where athletes, supporters, and donors just like you have helped us launch the support fund. I'm excited to say that just this week, uh, we sent out our first round of grant funding. $100,000 went out to 40 different organizations. Uh, they are health-related organizations and we're supporting their COVID-19 response program. Uh, of those 40 grants, four were awarded in New York City. And we were very pleased to uh, present this rapid fire funding to meet immediate needs. Things like get support the vulnerable, to replenish the food bank, and the like. Now, applications for the second round of grant funding are currently open, remain open until May 29th. So if you know an eligible organization, invite them to apply for an Iron Aid COVID grant. That link to apply. Ironmanfoundation.org slash Iron Aid, and it is also on the fundraising page. And we want to thank you again for your generosity. Uh, I did want to mention two of the sub programs of Iron Aid. They are Operation Iron Aid Face Masks, where we are repurposing new unused race shirts into non sterile face masks. Here's a visual. They're non sterile face coverings, and we're also making acrylic face shields. Uh, a second program newly launched is called Operation Iron Aid Nutrition, working to replenish food banks and also frontline workers. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly for donating some great memorabilia. I think we have a slide that shows uh, some of the gifts that he's provided for our Iron Aid drawing. A $10 donation is one entry into the drawing, which ends at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on May 17th. So please do enter. Thank you again for your generosity. Thank you, Nice. Thank you to all the heroes that we're leading tonight. As a born and raised New Yorker, I want to thank you for everything you're doing for my friends. Thank you. There was some uh, audio of uh, problems uh, with Sarah, but um, I think um, Dr. Deer can join us now. Okay, Sudhir, thank you so much. Sarah, um, thank you for joining us, Sarah. And you know, your work around the world has been great. And uh, as you know, uh, the work you're gonna do in New York State with this group is uh, gonna help a lot of New Yorkers. And I know New York's been uh, considerably um, uh, struck by this. And so Dr. Dewan and Brian, Chris, and uh, the whole team, uh, it's great that you're raising funds in New York to help those who are in need of healthcare and healthcare related things in New York. And you know, in my experience, uh, I've been raising money for different uh, areas of, of of charity for a number of years, but you know, we always raced in my my line of, of life. I've always raced for money. I've actually ran or biked or swam. But now I see people like you know Nick Bremer, who'll be with us tonight, and Paul Lynch, two good friends of mine, two young men who have uh, a lot going on in the pain world. Both decided to leave their practices and come to New York City and work at Bellevue in the ICU. It's that type of giving back that I. I just admire so much. And I, I think these two guys are, and many like them are amazingly heroes. Many of us like me, I, I really can't do that. So I actually try to, to, do, to do good work in other ways. And Iron Aid really uh, allows us to do that. And the money that uh, you're, 
you're raising tonight is going to go to New York State to needs. Uh, and what, one of the things Sarah said, if you couldn't hear her real well, if you have some um, charities on the ground there who are in need of helping, uh, for example, in Arizona, they help firefighters with PPE masks and things that they didn't have enough masks. So if you have a charity on the ground anywhere in New York State, please let us know ASAP. You can send me an email, send Sarah an email, send Sudhir an email, and uh, we're gonna try to get any money raised tonight on the ground in New York State, helping those that you're working with. Uh, so with that, I wanna say thanks for having me tonight to join you, Sadir, and thank you for uh, all the things you're doing to help others. And I'll give the panel back to uh, Dr. Dewan at this point. Thank you so much, Tim. You've been wonderful. Your, your help and your support is unbelievable. So now we're gonna start the um, panel. The first panel um, and first speaker is Dr. Bushra Mina. I have a you know, personal pleasure to work with him. He's such a wonderful uh, human being. He is a, a associate professor of pulmonary care and he's an ICU. He had a first-hand experience of COVID crisis and we would love to hear from, from Dr. Mina. Go ahead, Dr. Mina. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this uh, wonderful function that uh, you're raising money to help others and and getting ready for the hopefully for the next winter and if there's going to be any surge. Um, I think um, I had you know, the opportunity to be on call uh, the weekend. We had our first patient coming to Lenox Hill and it was in the beginning of March. Um, you know, we know that the COVID-19 is coming to our area, but we didn't know when or how or you know, there was as a system-wide uh, preparation at the uh, at the system to be prepared, uh, infrastructures and dynamics to be to get ready for this crisis. But when you go back to your uh, your home, an individual institution or your, your IC unit, um, we got the first patient, and I wasn't called. And at this point in the early, we heard some uh, review articles, some news from China, a little news from Italy. We didn't have that information that we have now. We didn't have the literature, although it's inconclusive sometimes, but we didn't have anything at that time in the beginning of March. So it's kind of like you're, you're going for your uh, exam, it just like, you know, the, the, how the website, <clears throat> web can be very helpful. So you can just Google, you get some richer research, some, some, what are the protocols in China. So this is, was my first experience in the first week in March when we had our first case. And it was a kind of learning experience. I mean, being in practice for more than 25 years, I mean, running the fellowship program, you teach, you, you, you read the literature, but you find out yourself, you're back against the wall, you're learning. You're saying something I never experienced in my life before. I mean, I dealt with the anthrax case when it was at Lenox Hill, and you know, experience, memory comes back. You know, dealing with an anthrax case, you hear read about it in the in the textbooks, but hands-on. So it's about more than a decade, and you find yourself you're still at the at the front line. You're learning, and you're trying to help the patient, and. Uh, you call your administrator, you call the chief of uh, infectious disease, and you can see uh, we don't have any data. Of course, we don't have any data because this is a new disease and, you know, what the Chinese did. So saying so, we started developing our protocols. And in our protocol, we are maybe version 19. And, and this is how we learned and learn from our experience, learn from others. Whether in Europe, we had webinars of people from Italy. And the goal is here is just how to help our patients, how to be um, put everything in the front, our effort, our knowledge, our experience, and try not, try not to hurt them in the meantime. You know, even the guidelines that came, some of the guidelines of, uh, you know, it's weak evidence. So, this is what turned to be an, an experience for us in the meantime trying to do the best for the patient and uh, and help what we learned from the patient that we treated this morning hurt the patient that we're going to be treating in the afternoon and in a very short period of time we had one patient then a few days no patient and then it's kind of the gate opened and then we went for, over closing our office 
went to 24 hour a day, seven days a week shifts. Uh, we made, did morning shifts and evening shifts and night shifts. So we went into 24 hours. And I had the pleasure and had the honor to be doing the first night, first eight days and night. So I volunteered to take the eight days and night. And I thought it was just basically being the senior person in the division. I, I want to give the, you know, we have to work. We can, we can be behind desk making protocols. We developed the protocols as a division. We worked as a division and we made the schedules. Our fellowship, we pulled all the fellows from vacation, from electives. And we had 24 hours as physicians and the fellow and also, also, we had the pleasure to work as a one family, interventional cardiology, neurocritical care um, uh, uh, physicians, cardiologists, neurologists, anesthesiologists, all came in and became one, part of our schedule. And, you know, it was, you know, not doing any night calls for 25, 28 years, going back to doing night calls, it just, being feeling young again and energetics and you know up on night admitting 16 patients intubating 16 patients a night working with the anesthesiologist and other er attending and there was no fear at this point it's a new disease everywhere everyone, everywhere everyone was worried about getting infected our fear was if why get infected and i can't do the the first week at night we're going to be short so being taken every precautions uh, from gowning, uh, the mask, I got uh, somebody donated P100 for me. <clears throat> I thought uh, I needed at that time more than anybody else. Basically as we took care of ourselves because we could not afford, have a, a shortage in the manpower. And this is our story as in day after day, day after day, uh, you know, we got a little busier, we opened another, uh, we took all all ICUs in the hospital, became COVID ICUs. We built two more ICUs. We built a negative pressure room, 19 beds, and like within two or three days, the administrator was very supportive. And everybody from the people that cleaned the rooms, the people that delivered the food, to the nurses' aides cleaning the patients, to the nurses, to the resident, everybody was as a one family. And day passed, we got tired. Uh, <clears throat> we were happy when our thousand patient walked at the house, a uh, hospital. And that turned to be a, uh, the father of one, our, one of our staff in the office. And you can see, I, this is not my office in the background, it actually is the hospital library. Our office was taken by the hospital and became to be a patient ward. So we want your office in a flash of light. Take it. We moved all our belongings. And in about in one morning, we moved everything and our, our office became a hospital patient. So I say is it's a learning experience for us. And I hope we don't have to experience again. How will we uh, from overnight? We change into and change our structure from fellowship, division, office practice, rounding in the service to doing 12 hour shift seven days a week, how to take care of the patient, learn from the from the what is there in the literature, come in with the what do you think best practice and try to help the patient and also how to protect yourself to not to have an empty gap. And I would say we only had very few of our faculty, including the fellows that got sick. And think, I think and the fellows with even the two that got sick that was eager to come back and share the opportunity. So, you know, sh to say is we're happy when we had a thousand discharge, we're happy with our experience with extubating patient and learning how to extubate the patient. And these are that we're very different from any other patient we experience in our life. This is not your typical ERDS. This is not your typical, uh, you know, um, some massive PE that you have to deal with. And and I would say as life is this experience, we enjoyed it. 
we were happy to help people, even the people that we were not able to help. The family, with the phone calls with them every day, you get some patients, family student calling and said, we know you guys did our best for our family. And they died, but, you know, everybody tried to save them and keep them alive, you know. FaceTiming with the phones, with the family in the rooms, and it was, you know, the best gift you can give a family to see her and hear the voice of the family who not come to the hospital. I would say also the, 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 the corporation and talking to your colleagues in New York, or even in Europe, it was very amazing. We have even a chat on WhatsApp with physicians that we know in Italy, Spain, Portugal, China, and, and learning their experience and know how, how, how we can help our patients during this time. And this is kind of my story at this point. Dr. Mina, it's unbelievable. It's just uh, listening to your story and as a as a person on right there days and night 24 seven and your energy and your aspiration, your desire to help other patients and putting yourself at the risk, we have no words to, to describe that. So thank you. You and others who are on the panel, you all are a gift from God for us because this is very unique experience for us. Uh, and I just have a very small, a short question. What has it affected personally as a physician? What have you learned? Uh, I will learn is that uh, as, as long as we practice, we need to learn. And we need to um, talk to among our colleagues. I mean, now is like, for example, in New York, it's everybody's a health system. We, we went beyond that. We all professions, we all physicians. We learned that communication is important, learning from each other, working with each other. And learning is, uh, protecting the patient and doing the best for them and learning that one of the most important thing is how supportive our family were. This is very important, very important because when you are struggling and working, the family is always worried about you and of course, you know, spread of infection. So thank you, Dr. Mina. Uh, we have no words to uh, describe and appreciate your work. Uh, Chris, you want to go ahead with the... Uh... Absolutely. Yeah, uh, hello everybody, good afternoon. Um, I have the privilege and honor of introducing Dr. Anne-Marie Stilwell. I've known Anne-Marie through our NICE activities. Uh, we've interacted many times. She's been in practice in Staten Island for about a quarter of a century, about 25 years. She is <laughs> anesthesia based and she recently decided to update her anesthesia experience by um, helping COVID patients uh, in her uh, local area. And we're grateful to her for that. And she's here to tell us her story. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I had been um, in contact with Dr. Dewan, letting him know what was going on uh, because we had trained in the same place together. And uh, I too knew that this was coming uh, sooner than most because my husband works in supply chain for a major corporation and he's been working from home for years and I heard him over say in the kitchen one day in January um, uh, there's going to be an interruption in supply chain because they've closed down all of the factories in China uh, we're not sure how long it's going to last but they've got some virus going on over there and that made me start you know looking into this virus and what was happening. And before I knew it, I had a year's supply of toilet paper in my office basement, a year's supply of paper towels. I ordered all my procedures and kits and PPE and uh, was telling my patients, you should go out and shop because I think there's gonna be uh, an epidemic coming our way. And this was before we even had a, a person here in, in New York, um, just from what I was hearing and researching. So with that, my own instinct starting to get to me and I started texting my family and um, following this and some of my patients and family thought I was nuts um, and they were expressing that to me in text. Uh, so I started to uh, become a reality even when there was nothing going on in the hospital. 
I went back to the anesthesia department where I had been the anesthesia a few years ago, and I asked some of my colleagues um, on a Sunday morning, I said, could you show me how to use the ventilator again in the OR and show me how to hook it up to the computer? So I said, sure, come on in, you know, in case we need you. And that's what I thought I would be doing, you know, uh, filling in, going to the local hospital. But instead, um, just uh, the last week of March, I actually consult for the Department of Health in the Department of uh, Office of Professional Medical Conduct. And I received a phone call from um, the head. And uh, he said, uh, would you mind going and being a medical coordinator at the Javits where you know we need to have a station of the Department of Health at the Javits? So at that point, um, I said, well, you know, is there anybody else? I really want to stay local for my own, you know, my own hospital and he says well most of the doctors who consult are over the over the javits um so i said um all right how long do i need to go for and oh probably just a week and we just want you to answer a few phones it's really not going to be taxing so i said okay i said i'm not doing that much in my office i started doing televisits so i said okay i'll go answer a few phones so that's all i thought it was answering a few phones well, when I walked in the first day, um, which we hadn't even started taking patients yet, um, it was a, a sea of fatigues, uh, something I've never seen before, just uh, a, a whole network of, of Army and Navy and National Health Service, all uh, very active um, in a massive room, the top floor of the Javits. Um, even just walking in when I first got there, it was a line Everyone was six feet apart. Um, you had to have your temperature taken. They asked you the same questions every day, uh, very rapidly, very sternly. You know, have you been exposed to the coronavirus and do you have a fever, ma'am? You know, and, and it would be no. Do you feel sick, ma'am? And it'd be no. Okay, you can go. You know, and then I would walk in with all these GIs and the all right, what am I doing here? But um, they ended up taking me under their wing and showing me what our mission was, which originally our mission was to treat non-COVID patients in the city and take from all the hospitals. So I got right to work calling my local hospitals and calling the, the heads of hospitals and saying, listen, what, what patients do you have? We'll take them. Um, I had to figure out, along with someone from the head of the National Health Service, um, how to use FEMA. FEMA would go and get an ambulance anywhere that I wanted them, and I would have to tell the doctors what I needed their patients to have available um, so that we could come and take them from their hands. Because the, the whole point of the mission was to decompress the hospitals, so that because they were going to start seeing a surge of patients, a surge which Originally, we weren't really believing. It was kind of surreal that this was going to happen. But then as the surge started to occur at the local hospitals, we were basically, by Thursday of that first week, we had basically taken 20 patients off of the hospitals. And we were saying, this is ridiculous. We have to switch to COVID. So just watching the news like everybody else was on Thursday of that first week, it was uh, the governor asking the president, can we now make it COVID, both the boat as well as the Javits, and we did. And Friday, they spent all day running oxygen lines through the entire Javits, and they had these massive machines that could make oxygen, and um, they had um, the ability now to, to deliver oxygen to every patient that was in it, because originally we didn't think we were gonna need that much oxygen. We, Um, it, it just got very, very busy uh, to the point where, you know, we were trying to get patients in, but the hospitals, when we would call, were too busy. They didn't have anyone free. Uh, as Dr. Mina was saying, there was just no one free to be able to, to give us patients, to tell us about the patients, to see if they satisfied the criteria, criteria which started out being very, very strict. They, they have to have had COVID for 14 days, had to be on less than four liters of oxygen. I mean, as I was speaking to the doctors at the hospitals, they just didn't have patients like that. 
and said, we, we, we're not gonna be able to take anybody if we're gonna be so strict with the, the uh, criteria. So over time, I started relaxing the criteria myself and saying, okay, I'll take them. You know, okay, okay, we'll take them. You know, Cause the army was coming over saying, get us more patients. Like w- what's happening here? We got all these docs downstairs, get us more patients. So we ended up sending out um, doctors to the actual hospitals to look through their EMRs and be able to bring patients. And then by that time, we're getting to April 4th, April 5th, April 6th, April 7th. And we went from taking 10 patients the first day to 60 patients the second day to 110 patients the third day. And I I had a headset. First I was doing this and then I had a headset and I I was, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., we would just book people to be picked up and we had 250 FEMA ambulances around the city and we would just uh, go get this patient, go get this patient. It was literally like, um, you know, when you see those cartoons where the guys run in, they they take the patient off the stretcher and they run out. I mean, that's literally what we were doing. There was no signing out. Um, It was a discharge summary, a MAR, an MAR, um, five days of medication and make sure the patient has a, a, a tracking bracelet on it was a way for us to tell where the patients were, were coming from and then potentially where they would be going to, um, called e-finds is what the Department of Health calls it. So those five things and we're coming to get your patient and, and, and overnight between seven o'clock at night and seven o'clock in the morning, uh, they would just like move all these patients. And by the next morning, we were full of those patients and we started filling them back in. And this basically went on 12 hours a day for, uh, it was a good two weeks that we were trying to fill the place up, also getting people to go. And and also seeing the change in medicine. When we first started, there was no um, hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC people were on. And, and, and within a couple of days, every patient was coming on hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC. And initially people were just on two liters of oxygen. The next thing you know, they were on non-rebreathers because to decompress the hospitals, we had to start taking more and more critically ill patients. And as we started taking more and more critically ill patients, it was now there were, we were opening up our intensive care units, which initially we, we weren't using intensive care units at all. So then the patient's family started calling. And then it was a whole, we had a whole area where they needed to know, could you please talk to the doctor downstairs and find out what's going on so we can you know, tell the patient's family because nobody had family with them. Nobody had cell phones uh, on them. Um, one day my, my son and daughter were back from college. They're both interested in medicine and they're both EMTs. And I said to the Department of Health people that I was there with, and we all became very friendly. I said, listen, I, I have two young kids, healthy kids, and they can come in and they can help out. They can go downstairs and help out. So, so someone had donated a box of iPhones and um, uh, toys and books and clothing. I mean, imagine these people were coming from the hospital their clothing was being left in the hospital and here they were now and they had no clothing except for a hospital gown. And there really weren't any new hospital gowns because the army initially forgot, oh gee, we should order hospital gowns for patients. Um, you know, there were some things they forgot to get. So um, we sent them, you know, downstairs. So they, they got to experience what mom was experiencing. Uh, Cause I had gone down there at first when I first got there where there were no patients and I went and I spoke with the people in the pharmacy because the army had set up a pharmacy, what kind of meds do you have here? So I know what to accept people with and what to tell them to make sure that they bring. And then just seeing what the cubicles were like, what they had in them um, and talking to the nurses and seeing the whole process of donning the PPE. I mean, they had everything from you, you, you. Thank you. And and Marie. Yes. Emory, you know, we're having some audio issues at times. Uh, I think we're, we're hearing almost everything you're saying and we're all very inspired by it. Thank you for your um, dedication, your sacrifice. Uh, just one follow-up question. Um, Do you have the pictures? Did you want to see the pictures? 
Um, no, I think maybe towards the end, um, maybe we're going to okay. move on to Dr. Bremer pretty soon. But what my, my, my one question is, you're, you're really chronic pain uh, and chronic suffering all the time. But how did it feel to change gears to relieving acute suffering? Um, I don't, you know, you, you just do what you needed to do at the time. Um, I would come back after a whole day there and I would see patients from 7.30 to 11 o'clock at night, televisits, to take care of my own patients who had issues, who needed medications refilled, et cetera. And um, they were equally as important, but it just wasn't as emergent and it wasn't as urgent. And um, in seeing as we all did the urgency of the situation happening, I think you just, you just turn it back on. You know, as, as Dr. Mina said, it just, you're just doing nights. You're sure. And I you're think, feeling uh, she, had, she had yeah, audio. There's uh, some uh, audio issues going on. Yeah, yeah let's Volume continue. Team. Yeah, let's continue team. Uh, can you go ahead? Okay. Yeah, you know, so so Anne Marie, thank you so much. That was uh, that was really uh, I can't imagine myself in your situation, and so thank you so much for that. I, I, I was really inspired listening to you. Um, I, I just want to shift gears for a moment. Um, at the New York, New York Society meeting about uh, six years ago or so, I met a young man named Nick Bremer who uh, was a naval physician, a patriot, and uh, so when Nick came to join me in West Virginia about, uh, I guess about February, March, I started talking to my friends in Italy, my friends in Spain, and much like Anne Marie, I knew something bad was coming. And uh, as you know, New York became the epicenter. And Dr. Bremer felt a calling to leave our, our chronic pain practice uh, in West Virginia, where we weren't very busy because all procedures were basically shut down, um, to go and, and really give back We're to Bellevue, where he had trained. Uh, so Nick has uh, inspired a lot of people in West Virginia, and uh, Nick, we'd like to hear a little bit about what it's like to go from a simple country private practice in West Virginia to uh, an intense life and death situation in New York City. Can you tell us what, you, what you've experienced there? Go ahead, Tim, your, your microphone is off. Nick, your, your microphone's off, sir. You're muted, I think. So there's a little microphone beside your name. It, it should be green, it might be red. Yeah, he is green on this end. We cannot hear you, Nick. Okay, I think what we'll do, Nick, we're gonna have we're gonna have Michelle call you and try to get that fixed while we go, we'll go into the next person. Okay. Yeah. Hey, could be uh, Ajit Roy. Is he around? Let's let's if he's back, we can ask him to join. Nick, hold on, Nick. Are, Nick, are you there? Can you, can you say something, Nick? Yeah, we're still we're still somewhat muted. I think. Yeah, we'll go yeah. to Dr. There, okay. Brian wants to go ahead and introduce Ajit. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, we'll be back. We'll be back we'll to you. Back, yeah. So is Ajit here? Yeah. Brian, Brian, yeah. Great. Brian, you want to introduce him? So this is uh, another uh, anesthesia or another anesthesia pain guy who has um, put down the needle for the uh, the intubating equipment. Uh, is he here on the? I don't see him on the panel. Dr. Rye, are you here? There, there you go. Hey guys. Uh, I got called into an emergency. Um, how are you? Very well. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. First of all, it's a huge honor to be uh, sharing this experience with so many dedicated colleagues. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm you know, practicing in California. Um, I did my training at Cornell Medical Center with uh, Neil Mehta, uh, Dr. Duwan's former program as well. Um, I'm doing primarily chronic pain, uh, inpatient chronic pain, acute pain, and anesthesia. I finished in July of 2019, 
And um, after that, I did Doctors Without Borders for uh, two to three months in the Middle East, uh, where I helped build a chronic pain program for uh, war wounded um, refugees from Syria, Iraq, Palestine, and Yemen. Um, after that, I began practice in California, and then um, my colleagues here in New York City began telling me about the horrors that they were experiencing here, and um, I knew I couldn't really wait. So uh, I left my practice in California. And my colleagues there were very understanding, and um, I got emergency credentialing at my former hospital, uh, New York Presbyterian, uh, where I was then staffing COVID intensive care units. and. I also got emergency oh. credentialing at uh, a handful of hospitals uh, in the Bronx, uh, which is where I am currently. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's so inspiring is how the medical community all over the world has really come together to fight this battle together. I mean, so much of the research um, in treating COVID is coming from anesthesiologists from all over the world. Um, from Italy, from Portugal. So, you know, although this has been very devastating for our country, I think one uplifting aspect of this entire process is just seeing how uh, doctors have been so resourceful and um, how we've been using our network to um, collaborate. Um, yeah. Brian, do you have a question for uh, Majid? No, I just think it's amazing that, you know, people coming from all over the country coming back to their roots here in, in New York where they trained and, and give them back. And I'm, I'm, I'm extremely uh, humbled by uh, your guys' uh, bravery and, you know, dedication to, to, to medicine. Actually, I'd like to ask you a question, actually, if I could. So, you know, you were over in, I have some good friends from Syria. So you're in Syria with a battle wounded and then you're in a COVID unit. What's the similarities? Is there anything similar Believe about these situations? Not. Yeah, so they took care of a lot of Syrian refugees um, who had some pretty devastating war injuries. And I think the similarity that I saw was the fact that uh, resource depletion there is very common. And here also there's a lot of resource depletion. And, you know, I'm very into doing humanitarian aid, but never in a million years did I think I would be doing humanitarian aid in a resource deplete region uh, that is now that is New York City, like wow. that was just mind blowing to me. Um, but yeah, you know, when I packed my bags and took the one way ticket to New York, uh, I didn't tell my parents. Uh, so that was kind of a fun conversation uh, when they found out that I had kind of flown into the inferno. Um, wow. But they understood that you know medicine for a lot of us is a calling, and um, I had to be here for. Um, for the city. Yeah, amazing story, you know, uh, all the places you've been. So you have to write a book someday. So thanks for joining us tonight. We appreciate you, you and I'm uh, inspired by you. And I'm inspired by Nick Bremer too. So Nick, you're back. Uh, can you talk about what it's like to go to New York City uh, and back to your old training grounds, Nick? Sure. Can, uh, can everyone hear me now? Okay, great. You're quite well, yes, sir. All right. Yeah, so firstly, I, right I want to thank uh, <laughs> Dr. Dwan yeah. and Dr. Chapman for the kind invitation. Uh, yeah, here. yeah, and I'm going to do that. my SIP uh, family, and I uh, thank Tim for uh, starting up this charity, so uh, you know, so we can help others in our in our process here. My my story is fairly straightforward. Um, it really started with an interest in what was going on in Manhattan in New York City. Um, I was watching the uh, COVID cases on the John Hopkins website for seemingly months and go up and up. Um, and this led to discussions with my other friends in anesthesiology as well as critical care. Um, there seemed to be a need for physicians trained in airway management, central access, um, ventilator management, critical care, proning, just about everything you can imagine in the hospital uh, to include the OR, uh, but I didn't really know how to how to help um, or really what to do. I started getting emails from 
you know, because I have a New York state license from, you know, Governor Cuomo and all these other kind of entities, you know, asking for you to, to sign up as a volunteer. Um, my old program director, uh, actually, Dr. Wajda, sent an email out, uh, you know, asking for people uh, to come. Thing. And, uh, and basically early April, things were in crisis mode, um, both on the news, but also in reality. Um, kind of confirm this with, you know, uh, friends here, you know, boots on the ground. So I decided it was uh, time to uh, pull the trigger. I got approval from uh, from my wife and uh, she you know, uh, basically uh, said I could come without delay. And uh, so I made my way, my way up here actually to where uh, I trained in anesthesiology. I was instantly impressed with how well HHC managed this crisis. Um, I actually had the opportunity to meet Bill Hicks, who's the CEO of Bellevue, and talk to him in detail about uh, the disaster planning. And uh, I just have nothing but amazing things to say about the people here, including uh, Sudhir Jain, who runs the anesthesia department, um, you know, ICU physicians, David Roccaforte, Caitlin Guo, Ken Sutton, um, and everyone from the other, uh, from the uh, pulmonary critical care side as well. Um, everyone just really works together. Uh, NICU, SICU, MICU, uh, CCU, and all the other ICUs you can imagine. Uh, so it's really, uh, really great to see. Um, you know, everyone's here for, you know, one mission, and that's to help the COVID patients, and uh, that's about it. I didn't see the virus itself as a major issue as far as exposure for me, partly because of my prior, I guess, Navy experiences. Um, There's this thing called operational risk management, where you can accept a degree of risk in order to kind of achieve the mission. And that's exactly what we kind of uh, are doing here. So um, personally, I, I just think we're just doing what we're, what we're all supposed to do, what we all are kind of trained to do. And, uh, and day in and day out, that's that's what we do. So, uh, so anyway, that's my, my quick story. And, uh, um, I'm just, I'm, let, I'm me, Nick, let, me, let me ask you one follow-up question. That was a great, I mean, obviously you're inspiring to all of us and uh, great, great work you're doing, but here's a question for you. Tell, you know, the news is so di distressing. If you watch CNN and Fox, you jump off a bridge, probably it's very depressing. Tell us a victory. What, what have you seen that inspired you since you've been in there? What made you happy? Tell me, tell me about a victory you've seen. So there are victories, uh, you know, um, they're victories every day. Um, you know, I can tell you my story today, even we're getting, uh, you know, kind of middle-aged, uh, very kind woman. She's extubated. Her family was at the bedside today. She's going to be moved out of the unit here pretty soon. And, uh, and, you know, that's a win. Those wins are hard to come by. Um, you know, they're, they're not you know, few and far between, but you know, they certainly don't happen. Uh, every single day on every unit. So, uh, you know, there, there are other wins. There was, uh, you know, a lady who gave birth, uh, you know, had COVID as well, um, you know, ended up with respiratory distress and both baby and mother ended up doing fine. So and that's another win. Uh, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. We need to hear those things. That's wonderful, Nick. Thank you so much. And uh, we're praying for your safety up there. And uh, I'll give it back to Sadir. Sadir. Yeah, Nick, uh, thank you so much. Your services is really um, uh, priceless. And uh, we have a few minutes for the backup if, if uh, Anne Marie is still there. Yes. Can you hear Anne me? Marie? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. You have a couple of slides you wanted to Can finish. You hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. We have okay, three minutes. Just, yeah, we have three minutes for you if you want to finish your slides. Yeah. Okay. No, I just um, these were a few of the pictures I took. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. These are a few of the pictures that I took and and you put into a collage. This is the Javits Center on the left. Um, this was the uh, entrance on the right. Oh, if you go back to the previous picture. Okay, that's fine. This was a uh, um a board that they had up. Okay, this is the, on the right is um, the entrance way where you, you, you waited in line and and uh, to get in and then go upstairs. In the center is just a, 
a picture of this is how we listed the patients, where they were coming from, and the way that we all communicated in there. It was a very uh, a, a quick sheet that we threw together, a smart sheet to be able to track people, to let FEMA know to go get an ambulance. Um, and, and when docs called up, uh, if we needed to speak with them, we had their name of who called. You can see how a lot of the people on the list were Elmhurst Hospital. That was our biggest, uh, one of the biggest feeder hospitals as you heard about in the news. And then the next slide is um, down in the right-hand corner. Those were the, the five pretty much people I was working with from the National Health Service and the um, Army and the Department of Health. Um, and the center is the list of patients. If you could, you know, zoom in on that, you'll see that the, the, the dates of April 6th up until right before Easter were, you know, the busiest. Uh, but this is how we would track how many people we had in. The Army's big into tracking uh, how many people were in, how many people were going. And uh, we never reached the numbers we thought we were going to reach, thank goodness. Left on Friday and discharged the last patient. Everything is cleaned and sterilized and left in place for uh, the fall. And hopefully that won't happen. But um, it was called Operation Gotham. Um, that's, and that's what'll come up. That, that's very good. I mean, those people who don't know the Javits Center, it's a center for car, you know, show you know, showroom for cars and boats, and it was turned into COVID hospital. And um, and Anne Marie was there. It was it's such a wonderful uh, situation, and and I cannot thank you enough, Anne Marie, your services. Again, you know, we will have some time at the back. We're going to move on to next panel, and uh, just stand by uh, if somebody has any questions. Okay, so um, next speaker is going to be Mary Carter, and unfortunately, her camera is not working, so we're going to be hearing. Um, Mary Carter on audio. Uh, Brian Durkin. All right. So Mary is a, is a very close friend of mine and uh, has been a pain nurse practitioner probably longer than anybody on Long Island. Uh, she's uh, the president of the Long Island uh, Pain Nurses Association. She is also a Yankee fan like uh, Dr. Deere, uh, me being a Met fan. You know, it's all right. Well, we're outnumbered right now. Um, um, and Mary uh, was working, has been working at North Shore Manhasset Hospital, which is one of the big Northwell hospitals in Nassau County, and was uh, really on the pain service, taking care of chronic pain patients in the hospital uh, for the last year or so, and was called upon by by the hospital to to, to put down the pain management uh, badge and uh, go back to bedside. Uh, nurse practitionering, if that's a word. So, uh, Mary, why don't you tell it's us a word now. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, what you've been dealing with for the last six or seven weeks? Absolutely. Everybody can hear me? You sound great. Yep. Okay. First of all, kudos, Dr. Deer, Yankee hat. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> um, just. <laughs> My background, um, I am an adult nurse practitioner and I'm board certified in pain management and I've been doing pain management for about the past 23 years as a nurse practitioner. And I did work with the anesthesia group out of Northwell for many years, over 18 years. And I left them for a different job and I came back as a hospital employee. I actually started a chronic pain service for Northwell in Manhasset. And I only came into this job in um, June last year and things were going along swimmingly. And then the beginning of this year, um, I, like Dr. Stilwell was saying before, I knew something was up and something was not going to be right about what was going on. Um, March, we started picking up a lot of COVID cases. They were isolated to one ICU. It didn't matter if the patient was intubated or not. They went to one ICU. So of course I ran to Costco and I stocked up on toilet paper as well. But um, as the hospital started admitting more and more COVID patients, the writing was on the wall that the hospital was turning over to a total COVID hospital. And of probably over 800 beds, there were two units that remained non-COVID. One was the oncology unit that houses the bone marrow transplant unit, and the other was the neuroscience unit. So of course, as my pain consults were tanking, 
um, I knew the writing was on the wall and I was going to be deployed as we call it. And in sure I was, I was deployed by the Department of Medicine to take up COVID patients. And um, it was hard because not working medicine and working pain management for so long, I was freaking out about not even taking care of COVID patients, but of the simple things that nurse practitioners have to do at the bedside, like blood sugar control or chasing electrolytes or chasing coags. And I can say the only thing that saved me is the fact that I, I do teach in a graduate nursing program. So just by virtue of my teaching, I have kept on top of things. I found myself deployed with, um, we call them ACPs, advanced clinical providers, which are NPs and PAs from all over, um, and especially outside the hospital, those that are hospital employees that are working in offices. So I've found myself working with a lot of orthopedic PAs, um, some, some nurse practitioners from pre-surgical testing, um, outside GI, outside plastic surgery. So these, these ACPs were more clueless than me, which was kind of scary. <laughs> so I became kind of the leader of the unit. And the way the units are set up is they have the hospitalists covering the units and the ACPs are there 24 seven, really taking care of the patients with the nursing staff and the nursing assistants. So um, I'm used to working 13 hour shifts. My colleagues I was working with are going from eight hours outpatient to 13 hour shifts inpatient and not just working six shifts in two weeks, but expected to work seven to eight hours within two weeks and also rotating to nights and weekends, which I can't tell you, I think the last time I worked a night shift was 25 years ago. I'm really dating myself here, but it's the truth and the body just can't keep up with it. I'm, I'm kind of uh, messed up when I work nights, but um, caring for the COVID patients, I gotta tell you Northwell was very generous with uh, PPE and even the N95 masks, we never had a want for PPE, it was always there. Um, as the hospital got worse and worse, they changed our auditorium. Our, it's called the Rust Auditorium, beautiful auditorium. All the seats were taken out of it, and it was set up as an ICU. And then FEMA came and put tents up on the hospital grounds in the parking lots that were now empty. And the refrigerator trucks started rolling in um, because we just didn't have the room. Multiple refrigerator trucks on campus. And um, I got to tell you, at first, getting used to the flow of taking care of patients medically. Um, I did kid around and I told um, Dr. Durkin that I felt like an intern, um, you know, doing the scut list and chasing labs and stuff. But I think donning and doffing the PPE was the hardest thing for me. Just before you go into a room coming out every time, it was, it was just a job in itself to don and doff, which became second nature by the second or third week. Um, very, um, I guess, gratifying to become a cohesive unit with the other ACPs I was working with and even the hospitalists. And I have to say we were very blessed because we were deployed with the nursing staff from the palliative care unit at North Shore. And those nurses are fantastic. And they were you know, basically telling us everything that the patient needed. Um, they're wonderfully smart with uh, a lot of the death and dying stuff. I did take on a lot of the death and dying. I felt that was my place as the pain management person on the unit. I took care of a lot of the DNRs, DNIs, and um, I did help everybody. I gave everybody strict pain management lessons. I actually had an argument one night with a PST nurse practitioner who wanted to give a dyspneic and in-pain DNR, DNI, um, IV, IV push I lauded, and was really in a sweat over even ordering 0.2 milligrams and I had to talk him down off the ledge and tell him that it's okay and we can actually order a milligram. It would do the patient no harm, would just do them good. Um, but probably the hardest thing I've had to do in all of this is um, not only the codes and um, calling families to tell them that their loved one just coded, um, the worst was doing the death call. Um, just I'd never filled out a death certificate or pronounced anyone dead in my career. Um, and now I can say I can do it pretty proficiently, but those phone calls are the worst. That's the hardest thing I had to do with this job. And I could tell you at this point, I am still deployed. I actually have a long weekend, but I'm back Monday, working days, thank the Lord. <laughs> and um, that's about it. Very uh, uh, bizarre and awesome experience at the same time.
Well, Mary, uh, we're grateful for your uh, for your service, and we uh, we hope you can get things back to normal. You can get back to treating pain patients sooner than later. I just like to say, yeah, because uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, pain doesn't go away. It's uh, I should put a little aside here that our service never quite closed down, and the other nurse practitioner I work with was deployed as well. And one of our main covering hospital physicians, Dr. Robert Duarte, was actually, um, he's in the Army National Guard. He was actually at the Javits Center as well. He was deployed by Northwell and the Army National Guard to work at Javits. So when anyone wanted a pain consult in the hospital, everybody has my cell phone number. So they were calling me and I would do on the phone consults because I couldn't leave my unit to go see the patient. Um, so I was kind of, I've kind of been doing two jobs for the past four to five weeks. So, All right. It's never a dull moment in pain. No, there's not. Well, thank you, Mary, and thanks for participating today. Um, thank you for I, asking me. This is wonderful. All right. So as we all know, this is a fundraiser, and, and anybody watching out there, if we could ask you to, to come up with a donation, we would greatly appreciate it. It's going to a great cause and helping these people that we have uh, coming out and telling our stories, our stories today. So. Uh, please, if you can find it in your uh, in your wallet, to, to to come up with whatever you can, and uh, we can help uh, make a difference uh, in in some people's lives. Dr. Dewan. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mary. This was wonderful. Uh, now I have a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is my former uh, colleague. She was my PA until she decided to go for uh, to be PA for plastic surgery. So Erica Bartoloni, she is a PA for plastic surgery in Lenox Hill Hospital. And uh, one day she was asked to go work on the COVID floor. So very interesting story. She, Erica is a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. And uh, I'm very happy, very proud of her. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that she could join us today. Erica. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, when Dr. Duan asked me to be a part of this, I immediately say yes, because it's Dr. Duan. <laughs> um, but after learning about the cause and seeing who the other panelists are, I feel even more lucky and honored to be here today. Um, so as Dr. Duan said, I'm a physician assistant at Lenox Hill Hospital, currently for the Department of Plastic Surgery. Um, about two months ago, the director of PAs requested a meeting with me and told me the hospital was planning to redeploy PAs from their specialties to either the ED, ICU, telemetry, or a regional medical floor to help with the anticipated wave of COVID cases. Um, all the PAs were instructed to fill out um, a Excel sheet with our individual skills to best determine placement. Um, so the next day, we got an email pretty quickly that the first two patients tested positive at Lenox. Um, at this point, we were still doing elective surgeries, and when they had talked about this redeployment the day or a couple days before, it seemed more like a worst case scenario in the future if they run short. Um, but sure enough, the very next week, um, I was called and told I was officially redeployed to a new regional unit they created. Um, so I was certainly nervous because this came faster than I was a little, I was ready for. Um, but since the majority, and since the patients uh, that I usually deal with in plastic surgery are usually pretty healthy, I don't often deal with sick medically complex patients, uh, let alone ones with the new virus we knew very little about at this time. Um, they called the unit I was going to CAP or COVID awaiting placement, meaning the patients were awaiting a negative test result either to be discharged to a subacute rehab or they needed to be approved for home care. Um, so some of them were stable and truly ready to go, but as anyone who's worked in a COVID unit will tell you, a patient can really be fine one day and then go the other way very quickly. Um, so a couple of days later, um, on top of that, it was decided that this was also going to be um, the DNR and DNI patients and their goals of care were going to be comfort measures only. Um, so quickly, our supervisor sent out an email reviewing um, how to pronounce someone dead, calling family with the news, what should really be said, and signing death certificates, which I've never really had to do before. Um, I've worked for PAs nine years, and the first five were in pain management, and then in surgery, so I was definitely no stranger to ordering IV dilaudid and morphine, but 
um, having to put the PRN reason as air hunger was definitely a first for me. Um, and to think that less than a week ago, I was doing a tummy tuck case, and now I'm in a unit that was created less than 48 hours ago full of coronavirus patients felt like an alternate reality um, and was really a major adjustment for me. First week was really tough. I saw things that I'd never see, and I was doing things I never thought I'd be doing. I think the hardest part for me was seeing that a lot of these patients were no different than myself or a close family member. Some had complex medical histories, but a lot didn't, and the problems that they were having weren't just respiratory. A lot were in renal failure, um, and from being in a hypercoagulable state, a lot of them had embolic strokes or pulmonary embolism. I really like felt like I was back to being a PA student on my first day of rotation. Um, I was happy to help, but knew a lot of this was out of my league and I had a lot of learning to do. The PAs and nurses I worked with the first week were also mostly from surgical subspecialties like me. Um, so we're, we were all pretty out of our comfort zones. Um, we didn't have any medicine residents on our unit, and since it was a brand new floor, there wasn't much structure. So the PAs and I did our best to pull together with the help of one of the hospitalists to create a workflow, like a regular rounding time and some unit-specific protocols, since we had a very unique group of patients there. The hospitalists that I met and worked with along the way were so smart and the most patient physicians I've ever worked with. After rounds, every single one always made a point to thank us all for being here and thank us for our flexibility during this difficult time. And they always stressed how helpful it is to have us here. Um, and while I partly think they were all just really nice and being nice to us, um, I can tell it was genuine and it really motivated us more than I'm sure they knew. But as stressed as I was in moments during that first week, I never felt unsupported. I really think Northwell did a great job um, every day especially the first week we either had a call or in-person meeting discussing how everything's going, what's working well, what's not working well, um, how we can make things better. So the communication was really amazing. Uh, the employees also had access to a tracking board that showed the number of COVID patients admitted, pending COVID tests, total patients, along with the whole curve, so we can kind of see where we're at. Um, so between that and the constant communication, I never felt in the dark about anything. Um, I was always impressed how everyone stayed so calm throughout, and there was always a plan in place for the next steps ahead. It was really incredible to see how innovative we've all become. We, our plastic surgery office is on the third floor of the hospital, and within just a few days, it transformed into a brand new ICU. Um, things continue to change and evolve every day, um, but after the first week or two, I started to feel like I had a little bit more of a grasp on things. Um, as one, as much as I could have at that time. Um, and by the second week, uh, they actually had me training other ACPs or advanced care providers because a lot of them were from outpatient settings and didn't know um, how the hospital works or the, e the EMR that we use. Um, so I went from kind of being thrown in the first week to now training people. And I'm really not sure, but I took it a little bit as a compliment. <laughs> Um, they also asked me after a few weeks to help open a new unit at Lenox Hill Greenwich Village, which was going to be similar to that. Um, and it helped decompress the main hospital and add to our bed capacity. So the nice thing about these couple of units, um, we did get to see some of the discharges. So that was really motivating to see patients that had been on vents and got so much better and were able to go home. Um, so from there, I went on to two additional regional units and worked with medicine residents, which was another great experience. Um, I continued to learn a lot from them and it was nice getting to know some of the people that were usually at the other ends of the pages for medicine and from when I was working in surgery. Um, when I first got called into that meeting, I felt like I was probably a last resort provider being from plastics, but from day one, everyone in these units made me feel valued and necessary. Um, I feel like even surprised myself in certain ways. I learned so much in the past two months and met so many amazing healthcare workers along the way in the four units I worked in. Since most of the providers I worked with were from so many specialties, it was amazing to see um, everyone's different strengths and see them contribute something different to the team and see each grow as a provider in such a short time. Knowing I have this strong system of colleagues at Lenox and friends in other hospitals to vent to, get advice from, and exchange stories with was something I found to be the most helpful during 
challenging time. Even friends or family outside of medicine that I may not even speak to or see often we're reaching out regularly just to check in. And then of course, I think everyone's favorite in healthcare right now is that 7 p.m. citywide clap. It's really moving and it's really nice at the ends of the shift to hear that. Um, so it's been an intense adventure in a short time. Um, I was definitely a bit nervous at first, not sure what was gonna happen next for any of us. Um, but after some time, I started to feel a little bit more confident that I was exactly where I was supposed to be and I felt ready for the challenge. Um, reflecting on the past couple weeks, months, um, I'm really proud of what all the colleagues that I've worked with and I have accomplished together and definitely humbled by some of the providers I had the privilege of meeting and working with. Um, the camaraderie really feels the strongest it's ever been across all the departments and roles in the hospital. And I think that's something that we'll all really benefit from going forward. So we're still in the midst of fighting this, but I think we've all shown really great resilience and learned a lot. So I did find out that this will be my last week. So next week I will go back to plastics, but if things change, I'm ready if needed. <laughs> That's, that's so nice of you, uh, Erica. Knowing you personally, uh, your dedication, your uh, your work ethics, uh, and uh, you know, I know you so well. I know your parents, and we are all so proud of you. Mm -hmm. I have just one question for you: How mm -hmm. did everybody in your family and your friends handle it? Because they are all worried about you getting in infected or putting yourself in the risk. How did you handle it? Yeah, I mean, everyone's worried about me, but I mean, like um, like Mary was saying before, I never felt unprotected. There was always PPE. That was always their main concern. Even little things to minimize exposure if it meant going into the room less or kind of doing it at the same time as someone else, communicating with the nurse um, that had that patient too. So I never really felt unprotected, but and I just assured them of that. That's very kind, very nice. Tim, do you, do you have any question for Erica? Tim, do you have any question for yeah, Erica? Erica? So Erica, I think, you know, I've worked with PAs, nurse practitioners for many years. And and what I find is, you know, many times it's it's your decision making that occurs immediately. You know, you really don't have time sometimes to collaborate. Uh, did you ever feel like you were overwhelmed by that or was it did it become pretty natural to you? The first week was a little bit stressful because, you know, they kind of, we started off saying, okay, everyone's stable and pretty ready to go home on this floor. And then the first week, like someone had a rapid response. I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> they're stable-ish. <laughs> um, so it was also the habit too of remembering, like, we're so used to just running into a room when like just last week we had a code blue and we all just went to run into the room and the nurse was like, ah, stop. <laughs> I was like, right. We're just so used to just going in and like starting chest compressions and to remember like, oh, right. N95 gown, like all the, so it's, it was definitely something uh, to get used to. Um, but we definitely, the first week I think was the toughest as far as not having as much structure and support. But after right. that, had a really nice system of someone could always contact someone was there so so yeah it was a lot but we kind of started to get the hang of it <laughs> so I, I would i would just compliment sudir because you work with sudir and I, I find that my pas and my nurse practitioners who we became we become such a great team and you really get the decision making process of those you work with so probably i, I would imagine working with sudir in those in the past and your current positions uh has made you very independent and very rapid in your decision making so i applaud you for that and, and thanks for all the things you've done to help those in new york very impressive first job so dr Joan fostered that <laughs> can't beat that for sure yeah brian go ahead for you uh... all right our next our next speaker is uh cindy corcoran She's with, uh, with no doubt, the greatest fire department in the country, I would say, fire department in New York. She is an EMS lieutenant paramedic. And uh, I've always said that's gotta be one of the toughest jobs to do is be a EM, an EMT in New York City, up and down four or five flights, carrying people out. So it's a wonder, and that's just a regular day. Now, on top of it with this pandemic, she really, I'm sure, uh, has some stories to tell. So Cindy, it's all yours. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to participate in this. I think this is a wonderful cause. And I'm 
I want to thank all of you for all of your hard work that you guys are doing. We appreciate it on our end because we, you know, we are there pre-hospitally, so it's a completely different environment. It's uncontrolled. You know, we don't know what to expect when we walk in. Uh, what family members are going to be, you know, yelling at us to help their loved ones is, it's it's madness. It gets a little crazy sometimes, especially with this whole thing going on because when we arrive on scene. Now we have to gown up. We have to put our, you know, don our PPE. So the family members screaming at the door, hurry up, come on, my family member's not breathing or whatever the case may be. And we, we have to protect ourselves because if we go down, who's gonna come and help you? you know? And unfortunately, the way that it went, I mean, I also knew about this before it hit the media. My husband is a Port Authority police officer and he was telling me there's flights coming in from China and they're screening all these flights and you know they're quarantining people and so I kind of had an idea what was happening and being that I work in Queens JFK is minutes away and we started seeing a lot of these patients in Queens because they were coming in they were family members of people that were traveling out of, out of the country so it was it was a little hectic in the beginning and it was day by day things were changing our protocols were changing you know, uh, one minute, every arrest, every cardiac arrest now is a fever cough. So now we have to don all of our PPE for every fever, fever, you know, cough arrest. And then every job started coming over as a fever and cough. So now we have to don our PPE for everything. And N95 masks were scarce. When we found out that this was going on, we actually locked up our N95 masks in another room because every other station in Queens they were disappearing. People were taking them. They were hoarding them for themselves. So it was a little, it was a little scary at that point because we didn't have enough PPE for our own members to protect themselves going into these jobs. Um, so that was one thing that was a problem. And then also, the people on my in my station, about a quarter of the people from my station, I have a hundred employees at my station, became sick. And they were calling and telling me that they had flu-like symptoms and they think that it's just the flu. I said, I think you need to go call and get tested. So we had a hotline that we'd have to call. And then they started doing um, surveys. Every day, we'd have to take a survey in the beginning of our tour and at the end of our tour in order to find out if you know, we, we had symptoms. So it, it, was, it was a little, it was very mentally uh, exhausting. You know, and being that my husband's also quarantined for 14 days because he was exposed to a positive COVID at work. So I have three children. My daughter's a type one diabetic. So I have concerns of me bringing it home to my household and him also. And there's nothing we can do because now everyone's home. Everyone's homeschooling. You know, my parents, I didn't see my parents for two months, you know, because I was afraid to transmit something that I had to them. Um, I ended up getting tested also and I was negative, but the next step now is the antibody test. So now we're all getting to this antibody test. So now speaking about what I saw on the street, um, we were seeing patients with O2 stats in the 30s, still mentating. It was insane. You know, essential cyanosis. Um, and then one minute, they were talking the next minute, now they're in cardiac arrest. You know, it was it was pretty insane. It, it was intense. Uh, we were pronouncing people, like 10 patients. I had 10 cardiac arrests in one day and pretty much every patient was an 83, which is a DOA. You know, we would go there and we had a new protocol where we would work the patient up first line meds, we'd give epi. And then after 20 minutes, if there was no change, then we were able to pronounce the patient and then call out telemetry and go through that route. So that was another thing that was changed. We actually went back to normal now, but so we would we would work patients up and if it was BLS, anybody could pronounce the patient. Normally it's, you know, the, you, uh, BLS can pronounce ALS lieutenant um, for a DOI, obvious death. So it'd be rigor mortis, you know, um, dependent lividity, stuff like that, you're able to pronounce on scene. But if now if the patient is warm and they're viable, we'd have to do CPR if there's no DNR or uh, DNI or whatever the case may be. So now we'd work the patient up 20 minutes. If there was no shock, we would then pronounce. And telling family members that their loved one is dead, it never gets easy. It's one of the worst things that you have to do. 
But when you're going to the same residence and telling them that their mother is dead and then their father, who you pronounced two days prior, is also dead, it's it's pretty terrible. So like I said, emotionally, this has been a roller coaster. And I, I keep telling my members that, you know, it might not hit you tomorrow or a week from now, but in a year or two, this can come back, you know, and, and it can affect you and you don't realize it, but that's why we always talk to each other. And I feel like speaking to your peers about your experiences is the best way to cope with something like this. You know, we've never seen numbers like this before. The highest call volume that we had was 7,000 uh, 111 calls in one day. Normally it's around 4,000 range. Um, and that was like the end of March, early April. Uh, it was, it was pretty intense. So. That's wonderful, Cindy. Um, I, I have not been more moved for, for quite some time over the stories that I'm hearing. And one thing that you mentioned, Cindy, that read that I really resonated with me, um, when I was in medical school, all the medical students rotated through the uh, emergency medical services overnight in Newark, New Jersey. And, and one common theme to that was that we all found it very difficult to cope as to what you guys walk into on a daily basis. How do you cope with what's happening around you uh, at this great volume and the great death around you? What kept you moving and, and staying strong? Well, the, my drive is to help other people. That's the biggest reason why. So I'd go to work every day and hopefully, you know, we'd be able to help somebody. I mean, honestly, we, we only got ROSC twice within the month. You know, most of the time people were dying, but we got ROSC. But I'm not sure what the outcome was after that because, you know, honestly, I wasn't going into the hospital to check on the patient right now as far as, you know, like I said, there's limited PPE and I don't want to minimize my exposure. so. I wouldn't go, but normally I would go check on the patient and find out what their outcome was and see if anything happened. But I'm pretty sure that uh, the outcome probably wasn't good because they were down for more than 10 minutes, so. Thank you, Cindy. Th thank you for that demonstration of uh, true inner strength that we can all take uh, inspiration from. Uh, Cindy, I think that was, uh, was pretty, pretty amazing. I, you know, we, I grew up with a bunch of uh, young people who became paramedics. So to hear your story on the front lines is uh, something we don't often think about. So it's really touching. Dr. Dewan, you were saying? No, I just had a very small question for uh, Cindy. You always have that kind of stress. And you, as you said, from 1,000 calls to 7,000 calls. How did you physically and emotionally handle that? It was very difficult. Um, like I said, emotionally, it was draining. Every day I would come home and then on top of all of this stuff going on, my colleagues were becoming ill, you know, going into the ICU on respirators. So, uh, you know, and passing away, we lost several members to COVID as well. So it, it was mentally stressful and exhausting, but the only way that I could say that I was able to cope with it was because of my peers and speaking to my, the, you know, the members at my station and their experiences and and seeing their strength and, and how much that they're working, you know, I mean, I was there to help them as well, so. Unbelievable. Good, so. Yeah, go ahead, team. Uh, I was I was gonna, go, no, go ahead. I was gonna go ahead and introduce Anna next if uh, I should have another question for Cindy. No, I was just going to say it's unbelievable and we salute your services, your hard work and your dedication. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely, and so, you know, having been, uh, uh, part of uh, uh, a lot of uh, emergencies in my career. Uh, we always appreciate y'all. Um, Anna actually is our is our next uh, panelist, and I think our last panelist, I believe, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Anna actually works uh, at, in spine surgery as a PA in uh, at Columbia University. Uh, before that, she worked at the Spine and Pain uh, Institute of New York for several years uh, in the pain community. So, and then recently. You've gone from pain to spine surgery to COVID, and I've been doing COVID for the last few months. So we'd like to hear about your transition through all those things and, and what you've learned the last two months and what you see going forward. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Deer. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Duan and Dr. Chapman for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, as you mentioned, yes, I've been working as a surgical PA, and uh, for the past three years, I've been taking care of very sick 
patients with um, very complicated spine deformities um, who commonly have uh, complications. And we're so used to see pulmonary, uh, cardiopulmonary uh, complications, post-surgical complications, patients with PE, ARDS, patients require um, dialysis. And when we were informed about upcoming epi epidemic and a possibility of uh, switching to ICU team, um, we, as a surgical uh, PAs, felt ready. We felt like we can do it. Um, NYP provided an extensive uh, training, uh, critical care training for uh, non-critical uh, providers, and we did our job going through online training, learning how to handle ventilators and, and very sick patients. Um, and when it started, when uh, we started getting more and more COVID patients, which was the end of March, uh, very quickly we have realized that they are sicker than we think. And um, one thing that we were definitely not trained for and definitely not ready for were the amount of um, dying patients. And that was definitely the most challenging part of uh, COVID crisis. So uh, my first night in ICU, um, I was assigned to take care of a patient who was 55 year old female. Um, she was admitted to ED around 5, 6 p.m. and uh, immediately intubated. She came to intensive care unit in, uh, around 8 p.m. I had to call family to get um, consent for A-line, central line, VASCAF. That became like a standard of care for all the ICU patients. Um, so you get a family on the phone, and and they are scared. They are they are very emotional. They ask you how how their family member is doing, and um, and you know as a surgical PA who sees a lot of patients doing better, you you give this positive message to the family. You tell them your family is going to be fine. We're doing our best. They we're going to take care of them. Like we just we just need to do what what's best for them. So it's a very first positive first message. And then uh, very quickly we we started seeing those patients are not doing well. And within a very short period of time they they're on max pressors. They are on a lot of medications to just uh, keep them alive and, and, and they are crushing and they are not doing well. So within two, three hours uh, within my night shift, I have to call family again and discuss the code status and, and, and introduce them to something called DNR, um, which is not as, as a positive and, and good message to, to give them and conversation. So, um, so that's the next conversation. A few hours later, we call family again to let them know their family member is most likely not going to make it. So at that point, we're bringing our phones and and, um, and iPads into patients' rooms. A lot of families wanted to have the last conversation and see their family members. And then you become a, a, a part of a very personal um, conversation. Um, so, so many times family members are uh, thanking their parents for everything they got, for they apologizing for a lot of things or saying things that they never had a chance to say. And, and you're part of it. So you cry and, and the nurses are crying, attendings are crying, and, and it's very emotional um, uh, time. And, and you can't even wipe your tears. They're just going to your N95 because you don't want to touch your face. Um, so, so that has been my life for the last two months. And, and I've been seeing a lot of sick patients. Um, I also had a chance to work in medicine um, department. I covered some night shifts um, there as well. So um, there were nights when I had 40 patients and, um, and out of my 40 patients, three of them died. And like Erica and Mary were saying, the most challenging part was the announcing them, uh, pronouncing them dead and uh, signing death certificates. I actually, before this uh, panel, I counted, I signed 21 death certificates within the last two months. I've been a PA for 10 years. I've never had a chance to, to be next to a dying patient, holding their hand, praying with them. Um, they, they ask you to, to call their family, to say something um, to them, to tell them they love them. Um, it's something that you can't teach uh, medical providers. You can't get them ready for that when the, when the pandemic is coming. So um, that was definitely very challenging. Um, you know, our sign-outs, when we, when we finish a night shift and <laughs> give a sign-out to, to the day team, um, we were just giving them information regarding patient O2 sats and how quickly they're going to die. So, so I would just say two of my patients are 
currently dying, like a few of them are about to die. Um, some patients like coded three or four times overnight, so there's a high chance they're going to die next shift. Um, it's definitely something very challenging, emotional, something that was on our mind for a long time, but it was happening so fast. And, and we've had so many of those critically ill patients. We didn't have time to process that. We're taking it home. We're thinking about it. Um, I had time when I couldn't sleep after my night shifts because I was still thinking about patients that uh, lost their bottle that um, didn't go home. So uh, we've learned a lot during the crisis. Um, we, we, we definitely got a lot of experience. We, we learned how to, um, how to um, be a good member of, of a team member, uh, how to count on others and how to work together. The, the NYP did an amazing job um, with, with PPE and dividing us into teams and, and working together and with attendings and residents, but it was definitely very challenging and definitely a learning experience that um, we don't want to go through again. <laughs> That's quite the story, Anna, and we really appreciate hearing about it. And uh, I would assume when you go back to your normal world of spine surgery, the stress yes. there will be very easy for you to adapt to now. I mean, you've been through the war zone now, so you've been through a lot. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely we're talking about transitioning back to normal. Um, and uh, the plan is to slowly, New York is doing definitely much better. We're now seeing for the last week or two, we do see patients doing better, re recovering, patients getting extubated. My first couple of weeks, we, we haven't seen anyone getting extubated. Almost all my, all my wow. patients actually, unfortunately, uh, died. Um, but the last two weeks have been much, much better for New York. And uh, we're talking about restarting some spine surgeries on May 18th. Uh, it's a very slow transition. They want to be very careful. Actually, every single surgery has to be approved first by the hospital. There's a special team that um, has to approve all surgeries, spine surgeries, and then it has to go to the Department of Health, uh, which has to approve it as well. So it's a complicated process, and it's not going to be an easy transition for sure. Thank you, Anna. We owe our progress to, to you and to people like you uh, that made our current state possible. We're grateful um, as pain providers that have sort of been sidelined, but you guys are the heroes and, and we're all thankful to you for that. And I'm going to ask the audience to recognize the sacrifice that's on clear display here by contributing um, to, um, to the Ironman and to the NICEPS effort to raise funds and, and help uh, the causes around the New York State uh, that are COVID related. So please take out your credit card, take out your checkbook, uh, go online, whatever it takes uh, to contribute what you can to this great sacrifice and heroism uh, that has been um, before us uh, as we listen to them today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's truly moving. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to just uh, say one thing that there are some of the speakers who are not just only frontline, Team, but they also have donated to this cause. So I just cannot believe their sincerity and their you know, work ethics. And I'm so, so honored and humbled to uh, call these people my colleagues and my friends. So you are wonderful. And especially, you know, this young, you know, Erica and Anna, and you guys haven't started your life yet. And you have faced such a horrible situation crisis. And you know, people will you know break down and get depressed, and you just fought through. So no words, no really words to thank you all. You guys, are wonderful. So uh, I don't have much time for the uh, speakers, but uh, panel, do you have any time, uh, uh, moderators? Any any um, questions for uh, the panel? No, I, I so there. I just like to say thanks to everyone, and and uh, I think that uh, you know in the in the tough times, that's when we really learn about people. And everyone on the panel today has been so impressive. But we've learned what they have done for humanity. And uh, even though we lost a lot of life so far, I think a lot of people were saved because of the efforts of people on this panel tonight. And uh, I'm I'm truly impressed. And uh, I think you're all very brave. 
know, I have a daughter who's a nurse in, in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the pediatric hospital, and she's seen her first few COVID patients there in pediatrics. So I think whoever's in their front line around the world and around the U.S., uh, it's certainly inspirational to all of us. And those of you who have donated to the cause, that's another way to help. And, uh, and again, that goes right to New York State on the ground for charities that work with people in COVID-related issues like, like PPE, like uh, you know, helping those who are quarantined who need uh, food and help and like those who need other medical uh, assistance. So uh, thanks to all. And Dr. Dewan, thanks for your, your leadership. Again, Chapman, Chris Grebo, Brian Durkin, the whole, uh, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Gretowski. Uh, Karina, uh, the whole team, uh, Ed Rubin, uh, it's very impressive. So thank you for including me. Thank you, Chris. Um, um, I would like to again uh, make an appeal. Um, and um, there's been no greater sacrifice than sacrificing yourself and walking into the line of fire. We heard the spectrum today. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, our speakers, and everybody that has signed on to get the full perspective or a better perspective to the COVID crisis. Uh, we pulled through this, things are going to get better. It is a different world, uh, but it's a better world than how it was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, thank you everybody and please uh, contribute and do what we can. Uh, and we should all do what we can to help out the efforts uh, through the Ironman Foundation. Have a good night and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Brian, do you have any final words? I'd just like to say thanks to all the heroes that came and uh, spent some time today with us to, to share their stories. And uh, you guys are, are wonderful people and make me proud to be part of uh, this medical community. And uh, any last call for uh, donations? I thank everybody that, that donated. Uh, are we able to continue donations going forward, Dr. Dewan? Dear. Yes, I think the next two days it will be still on, but I'll check with Sarah and Michelle, but I think it's still on. This is Sarah. Yeah. This is Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Hello everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, we, we wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone for their support of the Iron Aid COVID-19 Support Fund. Remember to please share the grant opportunity with health-related organizations who need support. Uh, that link is on the fundraising page. and. Uh, the Jim Kelly uh, drawing will be open until May 17th. So we'll continue to take donations all the way up until 6 p.m. on May 17th. Oh, that's that's great, yeah. So again, thank you all the um, panelists, all the frontline workers, caregivers, families. You all put your, your um, services before self and we have no words, but we just say thank you. Thank you from bottom of our heart. And I also want to thank all the donors who uh, made this um, fundraising webinar so successful. Our goal was around 15 and we went beyond. So I think we are, we done a, uh, now you, you guys done a good job. So thank you everybody. And I also would like to thank uh, our uh, organizers, Michelle and Sandra, as always, they have been uh, very hardworking. Uh, you know, this, this type of activities always have some AV issues, but they are right there to fix it. So again, Michelle, Sandra, you guys are powerhouse. So thank you very much. And I think with that, we are um, over the time a little bit and uh, uh, end of the webinar. And thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.